In this episode of the Delaware OBGYN Resident Lecture Series, we will summarize the ACOG Practice Bulletin 180 on Gestational Diabetes Mellitus for July 2017. We'll split this up into two parts because it's kind of long. In the first part, we'll talk about the definition and the diagnosis of gestational diabetes. We'll also talk about the first part of non-pharmacologic therapy, which is diet. And then in the second part, We'll talk about pharmacologic therapy of gestational diabetes and some of the other considerations for gestational diabetes in pregnancy. First off, what's the definition of gestational diabetes? It's carbohydrate intolerance that develops in pregnancy. Since a lot of patients haven't been screened before pregnancy, quote, it can be challenging to distinguish gestational diabetes from pre-existing diabetes, end quote. Technically, without a diagnosis before pregnancy, you can't distinguish them. But you can sure suspect pre-existing diabetes, particularly in someone with a strong family history and obesity and a high hemoglobin A1C, or an abnormal glucose tolerance test early in pregnancy. But generally speaking, gestational diabetes is diabetes diagnosed during pregnancy. Most cases are diagnosed following a routine screening test at 24 to 28 weeks. Gestational diabetes is caused by adding a layer of insulin resistance. Layers of insulin resistance in general include obesity, infection, and others. But in this case, it's a layer created by hormones altered by pregnancy. These hormones increase through the pregnancy and the insulin resistance increases too. If you're, kind, if you're trying to catch every case of gestational diabetes, you would screen right before delivery. But then it's too late to treat and do anything useful. On the other hand, if you screened everyone at the first visit, you would miss a lot of patients who would ultimately get gestational diabetes. So 24 to 28 weeks is the time you catch the most and still have time to treat and make a difference. The most common screen is a 50 gram one hour oral glucose tolerance test. This is a screen. It is judged by its ability to predict whether the diagnostic, as opposed to screening, test is going to be positive. Some institutions use 140 as the cutoff, some 135, and some 130. As you can guess, more people will flunk the 130 cutoff, making it less specific, but more sensitive. You'll catch more gestational diabetes, but you'll have more patients being sent for the three-hour diagnostic test. A quick digression here. The recurring theme through this practice bulletin is that there are multiple approaches to making the diagnosis. That includes what the screening test is, when it's done, what the cutoffs are, and what the cutoffs are for the diagnostic test. Factors institutions use to figure these out include prevalence in their population, resources to handle counseling and surveillance in affected pregnancies, belief that treatment changes outcome, belief that patients will follow the recommendation, and a bunch of other considerations. If you read the research, you'll see research can be very passionate about which approach is best. But the recurring theme in this bulletin is decide on an approach as an institution and then stick to it. In the high-risk clinic at Christiana Care Hospital, the cutoff is 135. The two most common cutoffs for the three-hour diagnostic test are the Kustan Carpenter Protocol and that of the National Diabetes Data Group. The Kustan criteria result in about 50% more diagnoses of gestational diabetes. We here at Christiana use the Carpenter Kustan Protocol. Generally, the presence of at least two abnormal values results in the diagnosis of gestational diabetes. But, according to this practice bulletin, number 180, quote, women who have even one abnormal value on the 100 gram three hour oral glucose tolerance test have a significantly increased risk of adverse perineal outcomes compared with women with gestational diabetes. Thus, one elevated as opposed to two may be used for the diagnosis of gestational diabetes, end quote. Here, we use two values, 
or one value if it's the fasting that's abnormal. Although other protocols have been proposed, like the 75 gram two hour one step test, the Cochrane database shows that no screening method is superior and ACOG is sticking with the two step testing strategy. So again, for the residents, find out what your institution does and do it. It's July and the interns have just started. They can read about the background and management controversies later. Does treating gestational diabetes result in any benefit? Geez, I hope so. But for now, let's leave it at saying the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force review found reduced risk of preeclampsia, shoulder dystocia, and macrosomia. Okay, we made the diagnosis. Now what? We start by monitoring blood sugars. A randomized controlled study comparing preprandial to postprandials showed better glycemic control, lower incidence of macrosomia, fewer cesarean sections. If you want the reference, go to the ACOG website and pull up the bulletin. Before we get into actual cutoffs of what's considered abnormal as they're testing, what are we going to do if they are abnormal? Well, generally we start with non-pharmacologic treatment, which is diet and exercise. Actually, we start that even if the blood sugars are normal, because eventually they won't be. So for that reason, we'll talk about diet first, then we'll talk about the abnormal values and pharmacologic treatment in the next episode. Dietary counseling is complicated and is often best done by a nutritionist, but as a resident, it helps to know the basics. I will try to simplify, but I will end up oversimplifying, meaning not everything is exactly accurate but I'll try to get you the general idea. Diabetes is a problem handling carbohydrates. When you eat carbs, they're broken down to sugars and absorbed. They circulate as glucose. Insulin has the job of getting the glucose into the cells to be stored or used for energy. Also, of utmost importance is the need to get it out of the bloodstream because the osmolarity of the blood needs to stay in a tight range. That's also the first slide in the DKA lecture. If insulin isn't doing its job, the osmolarity goes up, the kidney gets rid of it, and water goes with it. The other thing that happens if the glucose level isn't brought down quickly is that the fetus sees that high glucose level. It urinates a lot and develops hydramnios. And the fetus's insulin works just fine, so it stores all of that sugar and the baby gets big. The gestational diabetic has a hard time handling a big carb load. Obviously, she has a harder time handling the 100 gram load than a 50 gram load. She would have an easier time if she sipped the 100 gram drink all morning rather than all at once. So the amount of carbs per unit time is also important. A food that is rapidly converted to glucose will raise the blood sugar higher than one that is converted slowly that food is said to have a high glycemic index. The goal would be fewer total carbs spread over a greater amount of time. Three carb-heavy meals as part of a high-calorie diet would have three hard-to-handle spikes. Now what the best total allotment of calories is is debatable. Some say 30 kilocalories per kilogram in the first trimester, 36 in the second, and 38 in the third. Limiting the calories to these levels would result in three smaller spikes. Dividing the total calories into three meals and three snacks would result in six even smaller spikes by spreading the carbs over time. The glycemic index is essentially the same thing, spreading the carbs within a meal over more time, giving wider spikes but lower spikes. So, the calorie allotment, about 2,000 calories carbohydrate intake? Well, it seems that limiting carbohydrates to 33 to 40% of the total calories reduces macrosomia compared to a diet that has 50 to 60%. And then the caloric distribution, three meals, two to three snacks, preferably of a low glycemic index. Glycemic index is tricky. The bulletin points out that simple carbs, or sugars, are absorbed more readily than complex carbs, or starches. The thing is that the glycemic index is affected by a lot of things, like what form the food is in, what temperature, what is eaten with it, 
how easy it is to get to the sugar. A Snickers bar has a glycemic index of 55, and McDonald's French fries are 75. Potatoes are a starch with a lot of surface area and a low amylose to amylopectin ratio, which give it a very high glycemic index. Most of the starches, like wheat flour and bread, corn, rice, and potatoes, are very readily converted to glucose. And the number one food in the world is rice. Here are some examples showing that the glycemic index is not that intuitive. First, let's start with some starches. Whole wheat bread, 74. White bread, 75. Multigrain bread, 53. White Indian bread, or naan, is 52. Whole wheat, or roti, 62. Boiled potatoes, 78. Brown rice, 68. White rice, 73. Corn tortilla, 46. White pasta, 49. Whole wheat pasta, 48. Now compare this to the fruits and vegetables that have lots of sugars. Apple, 36. Carrot, 18. Strawberries, 40. Grapefruit, 25. Lentils, 26. Kidney beans, 23. Peas, 36. And watermelon, the worst, at 76. And to put it in perspective, let's compare it to some junk food like Snickers bar, 55. Pizza, 75. Corn chips, 74. Popcorn, 65. And soda, like Coca-Cola, about 60. Well, not only is the glycemic index not necessarily intuitive, there's more to it than that, including the idea of the glycemic load. That's the glycemic index times the typical portion size. For example, watermelon has the highest glycemic index, but the typical serving size is only 5 grams of carbohydrate, whereas ice cream has a lower glycemic index, but the serving size has more carbs. The point is that it's tricky and a nutritionist can find out what people eat. Many people have a pretty consistent diet that is usually very heavy on carbs. That's why the Dietary Journal is very useful in finding out why you can't seem to get a handle on their blood sugars. This is my usual digression into what I think is important. We tend to focus on the pharmacologic part because somebody else is focusing on the diet and the pharmacologic part is easier but it's the diet part that probably has the biggest impact. So next time we're going to talk more about the pharmacologic treatment and we're going to talk about some other uh, considerations including timing of delivery, antenatal testing. See you next week.